Hi. Today's scripture reading is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 39 through 56. And to begin, we're just going to read the first six verses right now, and then then read the remainder of the passage in a little bit. So beginning with chapter 1, verse 39. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And again, I said we'll pick up the passage here in a little bit. And I've should begin by just saying, I have been advised to keep it short this week, and not by a congregant, although I'm sure that thought has crossed not a few minds in the church. But no, I've been advised to keep things short by way of one of the commentaries that I read on this text. Biblical scholar David Lose, who I have found, as I've read his commentary on different texts, I have found to be quite verbose, uses a lot of words, but this week he suggests that we focus more on singing in honor of these women that we just read about who sang in response to God's miraculous ways in the world. David Loos writes, and I'm going to quote him here at length, Have you ever noticed how often Luke employs songs in the first several chapters of his story about Jesus? Mary sings when she is greeted by her cousin Elizabeth. That's in today's reading. Zachariah sings when his son John is born and his tongue is finally loosened. The angels sing of peace and goodwill when they share their good news of great joy with the shepherds. And Simeon sings his song of farewell once he has seen God's promises to Israel kept in the Christ child. Los continues, Why, one might wonder, all these songs? Because singing is an act of resistance. That's not to say that all singing is, of course. Sometimes it's an act of joy and sometimes of camaraderie, but it's also an act of resistance. The slaves knew this. When they sang their spirituals, they were both praising God and protesting the masters who locked them out of worship but couldn't keep them out of the promise of deliverance of the Bible. And the civil rights leaders knew this too, singing songs like, We Shall Overcome, when so many in the society didn't give them a chance to advance their cause of justice, let alone triumph. The protesters in Leipzig in 1989 knew this as well. While that element sometimes gets overlooked in the histories of the Velvet Revolution, it's striking to note that for several months preceding the fall of the Berlin Wall, the citizens of Leipzig gathered on Monday evenings by candlelight around St. Nikolai Church, the church where Bach composed so many of his cantatas to sing. And over two months, their numbers grew from a little more than a 1,000 people to more than 300,000, over half the citizens of the city singing songs of hope and protest and justice until their song shook the powers of their nation and changed the world. Later, when someone asked one of the officers of the Stasi, the East German secret police, why they did not crush this protest like they had so many others, the officer replied, We had no contingency plan for song. And that's the end of that longer quote from commentator David Loos. 
And I gotta say, the forces of evil today have no contingency for this song sung by Mary, who I'll remind you was an unmarried, pregnant teenager singing in the face of it all. Actually, both of the women in this story had, up until very recently, very few reasons to sing. Elizabeth was well beyond childbearing years, which in her culture meant that she was perceived to be a broken person, perhaps even cursed by God. But now God has brought about a miraculous thing, a prophet grows inside her belly. We will come to know him as John the Baptist. The script has been flipped. And Mary, well, Mary finds herself in a very precarious position with numerous strikes against her. Strikes that would still be held against her today, I think. Unmarried, pregnant, poor, She has no social clout, and what social capital she may once have had is now in jeopardy and for no fault of her own. But in the middle of the mess, her cousin Elizabeth prophesies. John the Baptist leaps inside her belly because the Holy Spirit has revealed to them both that Mary carries in her belly hope for the human race. God's Spirit reveals to these women in this moment who under normal circumstances would have considered their situation dire, that their situation is not, in fact, dire. In fact, they have been blessed by God. Elizabeth names what many would have called a curse, blessing instead, not curse, but blessing. And then Mary sings, and here's where we're going to pick up the text starting at verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And this part of the story concludes, and Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. But first she sang, in the middle of it, in the face of it, she sang, and What a vision for the future. The proud are scattered. The powerful are cast from their thrones. And here lies an assumption that those thrones are filled by those who do harm, who are not worthy of their elevation. And then the lowly, or the alleged lowly, are elevated. People like Elizabeth and Mary are found to possess all the Power, real power, power that God recognizes and enables and power that God gives the people to overcome. Here is a power that can give rise to a movement like the one we are a part of in the year 2021. After all, aren't we still talking about these two women and their miraculous pregnancies, their labors and their births? From them was birthed the bodies of prophets and of Christ, and now we are a part of it. We are the body of the baby who was born in a manger. Today, we are still a part of it. Saying that the lowly were elevated by this may be one of the greatest understatements of all history. She goes on, the hungry are filled with good things. Those that grow rich by way of exploitation leave 
the party disappointed. Their currency has no sway or influence in the realm of God. Mercy is mentioned in verse 54, which makes sense in light of the passage we considered last week where John the Baptist, that one who was leaping in the belly of Elizabeth just moments before, as an adult, would invite Roman soldiers and tax collectors to enter into the realm of God. Even the oppressors are restored to the community in the realm of God. The song that Mary sings here projects back into the past and far into the future about what God will do. In verse 55, she sings of how the work of God is, the work that God is doing in her present is but a continuation of the movement of God through the centuries. The same God who called Abraham from Ur to walk in faith and called Moses and the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt has now called her. She enters into the story. She sings in verse 50 of how the mercy of God is not just for her though, but for each and every generation, generation by generation up to the present day, and I mean today. Her good news is our good news, and so we are blessed by the song. This good news is for us as well. And here's the thing. God is still on the move. The lowly will continue to be lifted up. You and I are but vessels, jars of clay, but filled with God's Spirit and commissioned to do miraculous work in the world. Those who sit on their thrones do not hold the power that matters. The power that matters is found in the faithfulness, the courage, and the humility of people like Mary. The transformative power that will remake the world is baked into this song. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. And here we sit thousands of years later calling her blessed. She would conclude her song, He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And that means us. So let us join in the song and sing it loudly for our future and for future generations. She sang her song for us and now it is for us to sing about the lowly being lifted up in today's time, the hungry fed today, of the restoration of the human race and of our salvation today. Let's tell the world about it and sing. Let's lift up our voices and join her in this joyous noise and the wonderful work that God has done, will do for us.